Okay, guys. <clears throat> uh, let me see. I think we only have two people here. Yeah, we only have uh, Lucas and Sophia. Well, we're going to start anyway. So let's not worry about that. I'm sure the other people will show up. Um, and, uh, and I think today is the last class, right? For this uh, series. Let me see. Okay, so now we got Eric. All right, we're getting there. Okay, so just to recap, remember we talked about Islam. We talked about the beginning of uh, Islam. We talked about the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. Um, we talked about all the land that they uh, covered. We talked about what Anatolia is and was back then, which is what Turkey is today. It was called Anatolia back then. Um, so we talked about a lot of stuff. Remember that you have a glossary here in this particular PowerPoint. So, and that you should go through it whenever you get a chance, whenever you get these, uh, well, you already gotten, you have already gotten these PowerPoints, this PowerPoint presentation up to that point. So you should be reading the glossary just so that you can familiarize yourself because, you know, we can't cover everything in this class. It's too short, um, you know, four classes, it's not enough because this is a very large subject. Um, okay, so we, uh, let me see, we sort of ended here. That's the end of the third class. This is the fourth class, and this is the last class. Um, so uh, we're going to try to cover as much as we can, um, as quickly as we can. And, uh, and if you have any questions, even after the class is finished, you can email me. You can email the, uh, the administration. You can email... Uh, Carol or Jenny in the cloud class. And I'll be happy to answer it for you. Um, so anyway, so the Ottoman Empire really reached its, uh, its peak uh, at around, you know, around the, uh, between 1453 and, and 1566. That's the time that the Ottoman Empire had gone north into Europe and had made it as far as Hungary, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, all of those Central European countries were under the control of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they had certainly taken over Byzantine, the, Bi the, uh, Bi the, the Byzantine, the Byzantinian Empire, which was the old uh, or the Eastern part of the Roman Empire. It was a Christian empire. Uh, they had taken over that. Uh, in the 15th and 16th century, the Ottoman Empire entered a period of expansion. The empire prospered under the rule of a line of committed and effective sultans. Remember what, the, you know, remember what a sultan is. He's sort of a combination between a religious ruler and a, and a political ruler. In other words, he's kind of a king, but he's a king that represents 
uh, Islam that represents the Muslim religion in, in his, under his particular control. Um, one of these sultans was Sultan Salim, uh, and he was there between 1512 and uh, 1520. Uh, and he was, he was one of the ones that dramatically increased the, uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, like I told you in previous classes, we're not going to go into a lot of detail um, in regards to the Ottoman Empire uh, because you basically don't have time. Um, but what we can do is touch on the highlights um, so that you kind of have an understanding of, uh, you know, of what the Ottoman Empire is. Uh, and probably the best way for me to describe in, in few words what, you know, the Ottoman Empire. And let's just say that uh, the Ottoman Empire was kind of moving along like this. It began to gain strength. It reached its peak sometime around uh, the 1500s. Uh, all the way up till uh, probably around the year 1530, it uh, reached a peak uh, in which a great deal of Europe or part of Europe was under its control. A lot of the Middle East was under its control. Egypt was under its control and some of the countries west of Egypt along the African, the Northern African um, rim, you know, that rim on the Northern African part. And then the Ottoman Empire really kind of stayed stable like that. It wasn't gaining any ground. They weren't able to conquer more lands and mainly because the European countries realized that if they didn't push back on the Ottoman Empire, you know, they, they were very hungry for power. They were very hungry for the territory. They were very hungry for power. And they realized that the Ottoman Empire could make it all the way, all the way through, through uh, Europe, uh, could make it all the way to England. In fact, if, if they were allowed, uh, they would make it all the way up to Russia if they would have been allowed. So they pushed back. And, uh, and the Ottoman Empire kind of stayed stable like this, you know, maybe gain a little bit, lose a little bit, gain a little bit, lose a little bit. Um, around the 1800s, uh, they lost, they started losing some territory. Uh, and then in the early part, so if we, if we can just put something here and say that this would represent the 1500s like that, right? The 1500s, this would be their peak. And then sometime around the 1800s, they began to lose a little bit, but not a lot, they didn't lose a great deal. Um, but then in the early part of the 1900s, like our, in 1920, once they partnered up with Germany and Austria and fought the Allies during First World War, that's when the Ottoman Empire broke up and they went like that. They went basically belly up. They lost everything right at the end of First World War. Um, because they aligned themselves with the wrong people, you know. They aligned themselves with the Germans and the Austrians, and they, and the Germ and Germany lost the war. Uh, England and France came in and broke up the Ottoman Empire. They came in and they said, "All right, you guys, you were Anatolia at one time, Turkey, which is today Turkey, um, and that's it. You know, that's what you get to keep, Egypt." you're giving up Egypt. Central Europe, you're giving up Central Europe. Iran, you're giving up Iran. 
and all of the Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, all of these areas in the Middle East, in, on the Northern African rim and in Central Europe, it's not yours. You conquered it uh, against the will of the people and we're taking it away from you. And they took it away and then the Ottoman Empire went from being a fairly large uh, organized empire to what it is today, which is Anatolia and the little bit of peace of Constantinople. So, you know, which is now Istanbul, it's over here and the rest of Anatolia or the rest of Turkey is over here in this, in this part. So that's kind of the timeline. So if you think of it in this perspective right here, uh, that they reached their peak in the 1500s, they lost a little bit around the 1800s, not a lot, a little bit. But then at the end of World War II, which was around 1920, 1919, 1920, they lost everything that they had conquered through force, through force. Uh, I'm amazed that they didn't take away Constantinople from them. They could have taken Constantinople away, but they didn't. They allowed them to keep Constantinople, which is today Istanbul. They allowed to keep that, but they took everything away. So that, if you think of it that way, that this is probably the most concise uh, explanation that I can give you so that we don't have to go into a lot of the detail as to people like Sultan Salim. You know, these are guys that if you want to read up on them, you know, you're more than welcome to it. Um, and, uh, and you should, you should try to read about some of these guys. Um, but uh, so anyway, so here, I'll read one of these to you. He then laid the siege to Vienna. And this is around the 1915. This is when they reached their, their height. They could never really quite take over Vienna though. Uh, the, the, the Austrians really put together a tremendous defense and they pushed back on the Ottoman. They, they, they held siege of Vienna for a while. Uh, but eventually they had to leave. They couldn't quite take over. They couldn't quite take over. Now, uh, the if you were watching, and, and I think there was only one of you watching the video that I was playing prior to the class, but if you were watching that video, uh, the narrator said that uh, the Ottomans were uh, open to religious um, freedom and that they would take over an area and uh, they would allow people to, uh, to worship in whichever way they wanted. And that's not entirely true. Uh, there were some areas where they enforced Islam on people, some areas where they allowed people to worship, but they always had ethnic tensions no matter where they went. And what that means is that, and, and for good reason, uh, the Ottoman were Muslims. Uh, they spoke a different language, a totally different language. They had totally different customs and they took over areas that were European, for instance, areas that were Catholic or, or Christian. And they, they always faced a lot, of, a lot of ethnic tensions all the way straight through their, uh, their rule of this area. Uh, because of that, um, there has been many wars um, as an aftermath of what, what the Ottomans did. Um, as recent as 1991, uh, the Yugoslav wars were a series of separate but related ethnic conflicts 
wars of independence and insurgencies fought in the former Yugoslavia from 1991 to 2001, which led to the breakup of the Yugoslav uh, Federation in 1992. Its constituent republics declared independence despite unresolved tensions between ethnic minorities in the new territories, uh, fueling the war. And, and these are some of the legacy that was left behind from the Ottomans having run through this area and taken over this area because there are still many areas North, east, or rather west and north of what is Turkey today, where there are with large populations of, of Muslims. And, and those Muslims have always encountered tensions and problems with the non Muslim populations. And this is really this can be blamed on the Ottomans because they had no business in being in this part of the world. They should have never conquered these lands, never. Uh, these are lands with people that have totally different uh, backgrounds, totally different cultural you know, makeup. And uh, so you can say that these wars that actually started in 1991, the moment that the Soviet Union broke up, um, was related, maybe indirectly, but related to the fact that the Ottoman had come through those, these regions and established themselves as the, you know, as the rulers and created and forced a lot of people to become Muslims. It should have never have happened. But anyway, it did. Um, now, I'm not, again, let's not go through a lot of this. This is something that you will have to sort of read later uh, if, if you want to know a little bit more. But uh, from the 1500s onward, uh, the Ottoman Empire faced a lot of conflicts and a lot of wars with different people, uh, with France, with Russia, um, with uh, some of the other neighboring states. That was just part of part of what the Ottoman Empire was about. Um, you can't. One culture cannot take over another culture and not expect some hostilities to come out of that. Um, and again, as I say, around the 1500s was the, 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 the one time that the Ottoman Empire had expanded to it's uh, it's highest level. It's highest level, you know. So by the time 1580 rolled around, the Ottoman Empire had this right here in yellow, and as you can see, very large territory: Egypt, Tripoli. I mean, all the way almost into Morocco. Morocco starts like right around here. This would be Morocco. They didn't quite make it all the way to Morocco. Morocco was a Muslim country and there was a different Muslim tribe that lived or that, you know, made their homes here in Morocco. And, uh, and I'm not really quite sure that it was because they were Muslims that they were not attacked by the Ottoman or perhaps they were too strong and the Ottomans didn't want to take them on as enemies or perhaps because they even themselves, they realized they had taken, they were biting more than they could chew. They were holding on to more land that they could handle. Now, the Roman Empire, the, uh, 
the Ottoman Empire as, at its peak was about half the size of the Roman Empire at its peak. So if you look at the Roman Empire, it actually, we don't see England here, but the Roman Empire went as far up as England and covered, including England up here, and covered all of this. So the Roman Empire was larger, about maybe 40, 50% larger, this would have been the Roman Empire. All of this right here would have been the Roman Empire. So they were about 40% larger than, the, than what the Ottoman Empire had managed to, to get. Of course, it's a, an unfair comparison because the Romans had the privilege of having been in the region longer for a longer period of time, you know, 2000 plus years versus, you know, only less than a thousand years for the Ottomans. So the Ottomans accomplished quite a bit. They, they gain a lot of territory in the seven, 800 years that they were active. And true, the Roman Empire had almost double their territory, but they had been doing this a lot longer. Double, maybe triple the time uh, that the Ottomans had to do what they did. So, uh, so that's the fair assessment is that the Ottomans were just as bloodthirsty and as crazy as the Romans. Um, the only difference was that the Romans was a secular, a secular group, secular meaning non-religious. The Romans were not religious. They, uh, they worshiped uh, certain gods, but they didn't really care about pushing their religion on anybody. Uh, and their religion was, couldn't, can't even be compared or considered organized religion uh, because it was more based on mythology and things like that rather than the Muslim religion, Islam, which is a, a true, true religion. It can be considered a true religion. So the Ottoman Empire had the benefit of religious zeal, the religious uh, fervor behind them. The Romans did it because they were, they were conquerors. It's as simple as that. They didn't need religion to do, to do what they did. Uh, and I dare say that the impact, as negative as the impact that the Romans had on the people that they conquered, uh, they had some positive uh, inputs or some things that they did that were positive. They brought a lot of building, a lot of roads. They brought uh, aqueducts. They showed the world how to run a government. Democracy is directly related to Greek, the Greek empire and the Roman empire. The Greeks are the ones that kind of got it started. The Romans perfected it. So they gave the world, you know, these things. Uh, the Ottoman empire on the other hand, uh, were probably a little bit better at education. They were a little bit better in the medicines and the sciences, perhaps a little bit better in mathematics, uh, but they didn't really have a very organized uh, sense of government. Uh, their sense of government was not as, uh, as well organized and, and as laid out as the Romans. Uh, so they didn't have that. Uh, they uh, didn't have a Senate. They didn't have, you know, all the things that the Romans gave the West, you know. 
the Romans gave the West. Uh, they didn't have that. So the Roman Empire certainly had a much more positive impact on, on Europe and the West and the world in general than the Ottoman Empire ever did. The Ottoman Empire was good at pushing religion, uh, but not necessarily at pushing an organized approach to governance, to you know, be able to govern a large territory in an organized way, in an organized way. Um, so uh, they certainly did not, were not as positive as, uh, as they could have been or as positive as, uh, as the Roman Empire uh, could do. Uh, the Roman Empire in, its all, in all of its failings was uh, a very colorful empire. It's an empire that in the West today we look at uh, and we love the Roman Empire. We love talking about it. We love st studying it. Uh, we love making pictures, movies about it. Uh, there's a lot of things that we love about the Roman Empire. There isn't one heck of a lot that we, that the West looks at the Ottoman Empire uh, with any sort of awe or any sort of positive feelings in any way, shape or form. We view the Ottoman Empire as more than anything as interlopers. An interloper is someone that gets involved in somebody else's business and in reality should be staying at home, minding his or her own business. And that's the way we sort of look at the uh, Ottoman Empire. We look at the Ottoman Empire with that, from that perspective, from that point of view. We look at them as being a bunch of religious, crazy religious, nutty interlopers that uh, push their way around, push their way of life around, and uh, nothing very positive really came out. There were some things, of course, but uh, but most uh, you know most Westerners. If you stop a Westerner in the street, right? You go to Italy. You go to Germany. You go you know, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and you say, what, you know, what, what, is, what, what are your feelings about the Roman Empire? Oh my gosh, yeah, the Roman Empire, how great, you know, the aqueducts, the Colosseum, the gladiators, Julius Caesar, Commodus, Mark Antony, you know, that type of stuff. The roads, oh my God, yeah, the Appian Way. The Appian Way starts in Southern Italy, makes it all the way up to Rome. My God, that is so beautiful. You do the same thing later and you say, what do you think about the Ottoman Empire? Huh, the what? The, the Ada, the Ada who? Oh yeah, I've heard about the Ottoman Empire. Who the, who the hell were those guys? Where, did, where were they? Were, were they in Africa? You know, some like they are. They'll come up with some stupid thing. And that's because, they, they never really did captivate anybody's imagination, you know? And then when you say, well, the Ottoman Empire, you know, the Sultans and, you know, it's what Turkey is now and, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, now and yeah, that's right, yeah. I know, they're the ones that took over Croatia and just messed everything up over there. Or they're the ones that uh, had all this land that England and France took away from them because they were mismanaging everything, yeah, that sort of attitude. So you got the attitude of, you know, of uh, people saying that Rome was awesome and the same people saying that, oh my God, the Ottoman Empire, they, they, were, they were a bunch of interlopers. Um, and a lot of times the West also associates uh, Egypt with, with Rome, uh, we, we look at Egypt as, uh, you know, Cleopatra and all that stuff and Mark Antony and Julius Caesar and, and thinking of Egypt 
as having hit a certain cultural, political, and uh, financial height during the time that Rome was involved in Egypt, but yet we don't realize that Egypt was under the control of the Ottoman Empire later. Uh, but we don't know what happened to Egypt. Th these were lost years, lost centuries in as far as Egypt, because the Ottoman Empire didn't do anything in Egypt. Um, all they did was convert the Egyptians to Islam and, uh, and Egypt had centuries of bad economy, uh, uh, you know, uh, lack of food, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Egypt went into, took a backward slide when the Ottomans came in while they took a forward leap when Rome was in, you know, Cleopatra and all that stuff. Um, so certainly the Ottoman Empire was not, uh, they were not a stellar group. They were not a stellar bunch. We only know them for the sultans and the elite having many wives in a harem, remember a harem, a household with, you know, where one guy has many wives. That, those are the things that we think about them. We think about Islam, we think about, you know, and some of it is fair. Some of that assessment is fair if we compare the Ottoman Empire to Rome. Some of it is not that fair because they did elevate sciences, mathematics, and schools, libraries, uh, to a great degree. Um, so, you know, there's always good and bad in everything that people do. Uh, but my point is that the Ottoman Empire was never, has never been really looked at uh, in the same way that, that the West and many other cultures and civilizations view the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire. Um, there's no doubt about it. And perhaps it's biased, perhaps, perhaps we're being biased, right? Um, perhaps that's what's happening uh, because we don't like Islam, we don't like Muslims, perhaps a lot, or a lot of Westerners don't like it, and that could be part of the problem. Uh, but even the historians, you know, historians mostly write about, uh, about Rome and, and, and the Greek Empire, and the Ottoman Empire is almost like an, af like an afterthought. So anyway, um, so as I said, right after the, remember that little chart that I showed you, right between 1566 and 1827 in the 1800s, uh, the Ottoman Empire went through this period of stagnation. Uh, you know, it grew and then it just sort of stagnated. It went like this, you know, for like 300, 400 years until the, the First World War in which case, in which, at which time the Ottoman Empire was broken up. Um, so, um, so just remember that it went through this period of stagnation. And when you look at how big the Ottoman Empire was, you can see it right here. And it's pretty big. You know, it's a pretty big empire. Uh, they managed to uh, conquer a lot of land. And they suffered. I mean, you know, they, and remember I told you that they lost, they started losing some area once they hit that peak in the, in the early part of the 1500s. And they had mainly because of revolts, uh, because of people revolting against them. Um, Portugal putting money into armies to fight back. The same thing with Germany, the same thing with England, Italy, 
Yeah. They feared, they, they feared the Ottoman Empire. Um, they knew that the Ottoman Empire, any land they conquered, they, uh, they turned them into, uh, eventually they would turn them into uh, Islam. Um, we're going to skip this right here because, again, this is some of these details that you're not going to remember. Um, they're kind of meaningless to you right now. I'd rather you have a broader perspective of the Ottoman Empire. The information is here, however, should you want to read up on it. Should you take later on take a class and you want to go back through these PowerPoints and 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 see what they say, um, you know, you can you're more than welcome to uh, you know to do that. Um, and as I said, even though they had reversals, but they still were desperately trying to take over more land. Uh, what they really, what was at the heart of much of this was an ingrained hatred towards Christianity and especially towards the Pope and the Vatican. Uh, they wanted they, they, they desperately wanted to overturn the power that the Pope and that the Vatican and that the Catholic Church had. So they had their periods. They had their periods where they would go in deep. They try to go into uh, Venice. Uh, Venice was a financial capital at the time. The Medici family was in there. They were incredibly wealthy. And they wanted that wealth and they wanted the wealth that the Catholic uh, church had concentrated with the Pope and the Vatican. Um, they were really never able to, to do any of that. Um, so let's keep on going here. Let me see what, how much time we have because this is the last class. Uh, and again, as I say, you can look through this, see who some of these guys were. Um, the Grand Vizier, Kara Mustafa Pasha. He was a pretty famous guy. Um, he, uh, he led huge armies into Vienna, uh, but was eventually pushed back. Um, and he was pushed back by the Polish king and one of them, and he was pushed back by many other people. Uh, but at this time, you know, most of Europe, they were, they were thoroughly afraid or they were at least guarded, guarding themselves against, against these guys. They knew that these guys were very hungry for power. Um, these are the military defeats that the Ottoman Empire suffered and they suffered many, uh, nothing that would totally take them out of many of the areas that they were in. Uh, they would take them out out of the rim of the areas that they covered, but none of the defeats were able to, uh, to literally um, break, you know, break them up. Um, so, and these are some of the ones they came across Russia a couple of times. They had they fought a couple of battles with Russia. Uh, they fought everybody. They fought everybody because they they were hungry. They were hungry for for land. Um, the Astro uh, Turkish War of seventeen sixteen and seventeen eighteen. Um, so all of this you can you can kind of read it later. Um, I want to get closer to uh, the final stages of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. I think that that's more important so that you understand how that happened. Um, now, right around, 
right around this time was when right here 1732 and a little bit beyond that towards the end of the 1700s things began to get a little bit complicated uh, for the Ottomans um, and let's move on um, especially right around here the early part of the 1800s um, they understood that religion had actually impeded them from staying informed about religion, about uh, science. When you're informed about science, your military is, uh, is strong because so much of what goes on in the military has to do with, uh, with science, you know, creating bigger cannons, creating bigger guns, creating muskets that can fire 500 meters away and, and things like that, repeating rifles, all of that comes out of science. Um, and uh, they began to realize that all of their religious leadership and reforms, you know, had, had actually hurt them. They had actually hurt them. Like, it, like no, no different from Catholicism. Catholicism was in the same boat, you know. Uh, Catholicism would reject science because it didn't fit the Bible. And consequently, what happened? We, you know, the West went through the Dark Ages also called the Middle Ages. Either way, you can call them the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. They were going through the Middle Ages where everything was religious and the and society was not advancing. And it wasn't until the Renaissance in the 1500s, uh, in the later part of the 1400s, early part of the 1500s, that the West realized that they needed to back away a little bit from religion. Religion was actually strangling them, was slowly killing them. And uh, with the Ottomans, it took a little longer. Um, it took them into the early part of the 1800s before they realized that religion really wasn't cutting it for them and that they needed to back away a little bit from religion. They could still be religious, but they needed to back away a little bit from it. And they needed to begin to modernize things modernized society, but more than anything, modernized their army, uh, because it's all connected. You know, if you have a modern society that can think up of new, new ways of shooting weapons, uh, that eventually gets translated into the actual weapons that the army gets to use, that the military gets to use. And that happened around this time. That happened around the, the early part of the 1800s. And this guy, Salim III, was one of the guys, one of the ones to, to realize that and to begin to put together uh, initiatives that, uh, that helped the Ottoman uh, advance scientifically. Um, of course, they met up with the Serbian revolution um, they lost part of that area of Europe. Um, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. They held on, this is Saudi Arabia over here. They held on to Saudi Arabia um, for the most part. Eventually they lost it during the uh, First World War. Um, in 1839, the Sublime Porte attempted to take back what it lost. Uh, the Sublime Porte was a guy, was Salim, uh, something or another, let me see. Uh, Mahmoud, I think it was Mahmoud II. And uh, they called him the Sublime Porte, uh, attempted to take back what it lost to the de facto independent valley of Egypt and suffered a crushing defeat. And, and this would happen to them, you know, they would try to take things back, they would lose, but they, but, but the reality is that they held fairly steadily 
to many, many of these areas. They lost a little bit. They lost at the fringes, but uh, they were still, by the time the First World War rolled around, the Ottoman Empire was still quite large. It was still quite large. They were losing a little bit in Europe, but that's because of the cultural differences. Again, like I've told you, you can't, you know, one culture cannot overpower another one um, because it's just not going to work. Um, so then this was the period between 1829 and 1908 that we call the decline in modernization. Decline of religious edicts, of the religious stuff, the beginning of modernization. Um, and uh, this is a depiction here of Belgrade, which is in, you know, in Serbia, uh, in Northern Serbia. And back in those days, Belgrade was thoroughly, thoroughly Islamic. Um, and you can see here by the way people are dressing that uh, this is a depiction from an artist that they had pretty much, the, the Ottoman had pretty much penetrated society, converted people, uh, and not only converted people religiously, but changed their cultural way of life, changed their culture. Um, during the Tassima period, 1839-1876, the, uh, uh, the government series of constitutional reforms led to a fairly modern conscripted army. You know, the army began to modernize. Banking systems reforms, the, the criminalization of homosexuality, the replacement of religious laws and secular laws and guilds with modern factories, the Ottoman ministry of post was established. So this was a time that the, they, they had to push back on religion. Religion needed to get pushed back and they began to, you know, get a little bit better about things. Um, Christian population of the empire owing to their higher educational levels started to pull ahead of the Muslim majority. And this is, and this is one of the reasons why they realized they needed to modernize the Christians were not as fanatical as the Muslims were. And the Christian church in the 1800s was not impeding, was not stopping uh, their members from modernizing. But yet the Muslim religion was stopping people or at least impeding people from modernizing. Because modernization is an attitude, you know, it's an attitude. It's an attitude of uh, uh, being, uh, allowing people to do their thing, you know, to, to dress the way they want, to act the way they want, uh, you know, being tolerant. Uh, modernism represents tolerance allowing people to express themselves. And when people are able to express themselves, they create, they become creative, they become uh, better, more educated. And the Muslims were just not allowing it. Uh, they were not allowing it. Let's continue, let's skip ahead here because it's just mainly about a lot of wars. Let me look at the time. Okay, uh, well, they had made it all the way into the Caucasus, we know that. Uh, and it wasn't until this time right here, around 1860, that the Ottoman Empire began to realize how badly modernized they were and how bad education was. And this was a time when they began to really heavily invest in education. Um, the Bulgarian uprising, massacring up to 100,000 people in the process, they were pretty brutal. There's no doubt that they were pretty brutal as a result, Ottoman holdings in Europe declined. You know, 
By this time, uh, economies were tied more, were, were dependent one on the other. Back in the 1400s, before railroads and before big ships that could carry merchandise and things like that, uh, you could have a country or a, an empire like the Ottoman be totally isolated and they could do whatever the heck they wanted and not really face any repercussions. But once the other countries began to modernize, once railroads began to be built and big ships began to be built and the Russians realized that uh, their economy would do better when they traded with the Germans. The Germans realized that they needed to, tra to trade with the Italians and so forth and so on. Um, if a country would do something that the other countries did not like, those other countries would shut them off, would not trade with them. And that's what happened to the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire would face sort of a, uh, a cancel culture of sorts. These countries would not want to trade with them as long as the Ottoman Empire was showing a great degree of aggressiveness. And that's something that began to happen around the 18, you know, around 1870. Um, British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli advocated for restoring the Ottoman ter territories of the Balkan Peninsula during the Congress of Berlin. And in return, Britain assumed the administration of Cyprus in 1878. Britain later sent troops to Egypt in 1882 to put down the Urabi revolt. Sultan Abdul Hamid II was too paranoid to mobilize his own army, fearing his, this would result in a coup d'etat, effectively gaining control in both territories. Abdul Amid II, but, but all of these things were minor and they were temporary. You know, so this guy here, British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, sided with the Ottomans saying, let's give them back the Balkans, let them manage the Balkans. But it really never came to fruition. It never came to fruition because Russia wouldn't allow it and Germany wouldn't allow it. Um, so it was really wasted, wasted conversation in reality. Um, now, here's the other thing. And remember what I told you that we're going to hit the highlights and the highlights is the climax, the stagnation, you know, and then finally they decline around the breakup, the complete breakup. But around 1897, um, they started exterminating. They started killing off the Armenians. And I think I showed you last time I showed you, I was showing a video before the class. And I told you that President Biden, finally, the United States, President Biden called uh, what happened to the Armenian a genocide, uh, a total of uh, a million Armenians were killed were exterminated by the uh, Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, you know, Turkey today says that it happened during a time of war, that they did not go out purposely to exterminate large portions of the Armenian uh, population. Um, but you know, the, uh, the evidence left behind after a hundred years of this event happening, tell a different story. 
they tell a different story. But anyway, things, these, these sort of tensions began around the, the 1890s. That's when these tensions uh, began to surface. Finally, uh, defeat and dissolution. Now remember that we're still dealing with the extermination of the Armenian people. Remember that this is a very important event in the history of the Ottoman Empire. All evidence points to the fact that they did, that the Ottoman people, the Ottoman army, the Ottoman government, the Sultan of the, of the Ottoman Empire purposely and deliberately exterminated Armenians. And a million of them fell, a million of them were killed. So remember that. But now we're gonna start now, the, the, set, the first world war starts and this is the beginning of the end for the Ottoman Empire. This is the beginning of the end for the Ottoman Empire. First of all, internally, the Ottoman Empire was facing uh, dissent, was facing groups of people who wanted a more modern society. Uh, there was one movement called the Young Turk Movement. The defeat and dissolution of the uh, Ottoman Empire, 1908 and 1922, began with the second constitutional era, a moment of hope and promise established with a young Turk revolution. It restored the Ottoman constitution of 1876 and brought in multi-party politics with a two-stage electoral system or electoral law under the Ottoman parliament. So prior to this, um, there was no parliament, you know, parliament is like a Senate, like a Congress. Uh, there were no electoral laws. Um, you know, you had a Sultan who ran the show. Uh, nobody could tell him what to do. He was a sovereign, so, a sovereign leader, meaning that he was on his own. Nobody checked him, nobody checked his power. Um, and uh, there was this movement called the Young Turk Movement. The constitution offered hope by freeing the empire citizens to modernize the state's institutions, rejuvenate its strength and enable it to hold its own against outside powers. It gar its guarantee of liberties promised to dissolve intercommunal tensions and transform the empire into a more harmonious place. Instead, this period became the story of the twilight struggle of the empire. And what that means is that this was the beginning of the end. You know, um, people began to realize what an oppressive empire, the Ottoman empire was. People began to realize they, they wanted freedoms. Uh, they wanted ways of uh, stepping back from religious oppression, from religion. They wanted to step back from uh, single man rule. And that sort of internal strife is what will bring a, an empire down. It's never external alone. Yes, external forces are needed, but it's always external and internal, external and internal. Members of the Young Turk movement who had once gone underground to establish their parties, their parties, among them Committee of Union and, and Progress and Freedom and Accord Party were major parties. On the other end of the spectrum were ethnic parties, which included Paolo Zion, Al Fatak, an Armenian national movement organized under the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. 
profiting from the civil strife, Austria-Hungary officially annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina in 1908. The last of the Ottoman censuses was performed in 1914, despite military reform, which rec uh, reconstituted the Ottoman modern army, the empire lost its North African territories and the Dodecanese in the Italo-Turkish War. And almost all its European territories in the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913. So once they lost the Balkans, they lost a big chunk of their territory. And this was further going down the uh, going down into the pit. Uh, the empire faced continuous unrest in the years leading up to World War I, including the Ottoman counter coup of 1909, the 31st March incident, and two further coups in 1912 and 1913. And as I say, always, whenever an empire, a country, a, a nation goes down, like it happened in Rome, it's never external alone. It is always a combination of both. People in the inside are sick and tired of the way they've been treated and they begin to revolt. And then people from the outside, they see that as an opportunity and they attack. And then all of a sudden, boom, an empire goes down. An empire disappears, goes down, breaks up into little pieces. Somebody else comes in and takes over, whatever. Whatever happens, but it's always due to internal and external strife. Always remember that, internal and external strife. Um, the Ottoman Empire came into World War I as one of the central powers. The Ottoman Empire entered the war by carrying out a surprise attack on, Russian, on Russia's Black Sea coast on the 29th of, of October. 1914, with Russia responding by declaring war on, the 5th, on November 5th, 1914. Ottoman forces fought the Entente in the Balkans and the Middle Eastern theater of World War I. The Ottoman Empire's defeat in the war in 1918 was crucial in the eventual resolution, dissolution, dissolution of the empire in 1921. So once they lost that battle, once they lost that war, that was the end. That was the end. That was the end of the Ottoman Empire. Now, it is important to remember the Armenian genocide. You will hear about this many times. Many times in the course of your life, in the course of your um, education, you will hear about the Armenian genocide. And while, the, while Turkey today refuses to admit that they did this, the evidence left behind is too big, too strong. Everybody, most nations in the world call it a genocide. The United States did not call it a genocide because Turkey has been an ally for many years until now that we, that they have a president who is not a very nice guy. His name is Erdogan and he's not a, a nice person. Uh, but uh, up till recently they have been an ally and the United States did not want to call what happened a genocide. But now things have changed. Erdogan continues to be a jerk and President Biden called it a genocide. Brought a lot of tensions between both countries. Erdogan wanted to kick out the ambassador of the United States. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. But the truth of the matter is, is that everybody and their dog and their cats, they know that this was genocide. A million Armenians 
were exterminated by the Ottoman Empire. Um, the genocide was carried out during and after World War I and implemented in two, in two phases. The wholesale killing of the able-bodied male population through massacre and subjection of army conscripts to forced labor, followed by the deportation of women, children, the elder elderly and infirm and the sick on death marches leading to the Syrian desert. Driving forward by military escorts, the deportees were deprived of food and water and subjected to per periodic robbery, rape, and systematic massacre. Large scale massacres were also committed against the empires, Greek and Assyrian minorities as part of the same campaign of ethnic cleansing. That's a word, that's a phrase that you will hear often, ethnic cleansing. And that is when one predominantly strong culture or society tries to exterminate another one that is less powerful, less strong, who cannot defend themselves. And these guys try to do that. And that happens all the time. Unfortunately, that still happens today in the 21st century, it's happening. Then of course, the Arabs revolted. Uh, they saw an opportunity, they had been governed by the Ottoman Empire and they did not like it. Nobody wants somebody else who is not part of their culture governing them. So there was an Arab revolt and that was kind of like what closed the chapter for the Ottoman. And then finally, it was all over. The Ottoman Empire became Turkey, one tenth of the size that it once was. They managed to keep Constantinople, which is uh, Istanbul right now, but that's all they managed to do. They went back into Anatolia, which was their traditional land where they originally uh, came from. And then that was the end of that. The Treaty of Sevra and Turkish War of Independence, in that treaty, the Ottoman Empire was pushed back. And uh, so now, right after the war, this is the map of how it was, the Ottoman Empire. This part of the, Arab, of the Ottoman Empire went under French control this part on their uh, British control. Armenia took over the land that they had initially lost uh, and so forth. You know, this became part of the Greek zone. And uh, so that was it. And they had all of this. They had all of it. But they, uh, they lost it all. Um, Government, the government uh, changed drastically right after that. They became a little bit more democratic. Um, they instituted uh, a, uh, sort of a Senate, not a Senate, but a parliament. And the Sultan uh, changed, no more Sultan uh, since then. Turkey has presidents who are duly elected by the people. And, uh, and now it is what Turkey is. Uh, the days of the harems and the wild women running around the castle and all that stuff, all of that is finished. So the law, the law is less religious, more secular now. Um, there are still some parts of the law that sort of pick up a few things from Sharia law. Remember Sharia being the, uh, the Islamic law. Uh, let's see, but that's pretty much it. 
religion. Well, you'll have to read all of that because we're totally out of time. But uh, it's always been mostly Islam with a few Christians. They're, they're called the Christians over there are called Christian Coptics. Coptic, the Coptic Christian Church. Um, so uh, let me see. You'll have to read all of this. The economy has never really been great. They've had some periods where the economy has been good. Right now, the economy is in terrible shape. Um, the Jews were, you know, this was a problem with the Jews. Uh, the Jews were allowed to live in Turkey, but not, uh, not with a lot of freedoms and stuff like that. So uh, they had a divided school system for many years. In other words, one school that was Christian that would teach Christian kids and then the other school that was uh, Islamic and would teach the Islamic kids. So even those tensions have survived. Now architecture, if you ever, if you ever go to Istanbul, you're going to see some amazing architecture. These spires over here is very typically Islamic. I'm not sure what it means, but uh, you know, the blue mosque used to be a uh, was it the blue mosque that was the, uh, maybe not, maybe not, I take it back. There, there was one church that became a mosque and it was a very famous church. Anyway, um, this is the architecture today. Really very interesting. It's a beautiful place. It's gorgeous. If you ever get to go to Turkey and you go to Istanbul or Ankara or any one of those, um, you see a combination of Western and uh, Eastern, Islamic Eastern mixture of the two. And uh, it's beautiful, just totally beautiful. The art is beautiful. The art is uh, centered around calligraphy. You know, calligraphy is the way you write. So you get a lot of this uh, art that's calligraphy based. And these collages that are really very interesting. Uh, and uh, the rugs, you know, the Turkish rugs are world known. They make these fabulous Turkish rugs. I went to Istanbul one time and I bought a rug and I brought it home. And then when we moved from uh, South Florida into up here, we sold it because it was too large. But anyway, I brought that, that, uh, it's called an area rug. It doesn't cover the whole house, you know, it's just a piece. And it was beautiful. It was just gorgeous. And uh, music and performing arts, yeah, you know, everybody has it. So I'll leave this for you guys to uh, read later. And if there are any questions whatsoever, just uh, blur them out round. Otherwise, we're going to close the class. Um, if you have any questions or answers, we can discuss them for the next five minutes. And then I am leaving. I want to eat something, take a shower, and get ready to go to bed. So, my fine friends, what say you? Anything, any questions, any comments? What part of history would you like to learn for next time? Do you still are you guys interested in hearing Charlemagne and the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantinian Byzantium Empire, the Byzantine Empire? Or would you like to learn about the first kings in England? Richard, Arthur. Somebody's saying something. How about King George III? Um, you're talking about Hen uh, King George III. That's a little bit later, you know. I would, you know, you need to understand the first kings first. Um, and that would be Arthur, Richard, uh, eventually Henry VIII. You know, we can cover those. We can cover those. The Holy Roman Empire 
the Holy Roman Empire is very interesting. It was led by a guy by the name of Car Charlemagne. And that he was quite the character. He really was. But we can do, we can do the early kings. Uh, we can do the first king to be overthrown. And he was overthrown by his wife, by Queen Isabella, who got mad at him. And she went to live in France and, and she divorced him. Well, they didn't divorce him. They didn't allow divorce. But she picked up an army and came back and overthrew the guy. And that was Arthur. So we can, we can go into that. We can do that if you guys want. I think that you need to understand, you, you need to go into steps, you know, chronological steps. Don't jump ahead because then you're not going to understand the stuff before that. So the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire, you know, those two are the next in line. And then once we do that, then we can go into, you know, we can do England, we can do the French Revolution, we can do the Napoleonic Wars, you know, Napoleon and all those crazy guys. We can do uh, the Napoleonic Wars, then we can do the Russian Revolution. Uh, the Soviets, um, and, uh, you know, that'll give you a pretty good idea of world history. So, uh, anyway. Okay, my dear friends, see you later, alligator. Bye. 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 Bye.